executive director and STEM ambassador, primarily in the space sector. I chair the Global Network on Sustainability in Space, which works to bring scientists, industry, and policymakers together to accelerate progress on space traffic management. Uh, I'm also a former chief executive of the UK Space Agency. I'm absolutely delighted to have this opportunity today to speak with Anne Vandenbroek, Frank Salzgeber, and Joshua Lecter about space innovation. Um, we may not have Anne with us straight away, uh, I know that the team are working on uh, getting her onto the stage. Um, hopefully when Anne joins us, I'll give a brief intro to her anyway. Uh, she is the Chief Regulatory Officer at Avanti Communications Group. Her team deals with all matters relating to optimizing the use of Avanti spectrum, their orbital positions, and creating routes to market. Uh, she was also involved in developing the UK government's space innovation and growth strategy. Um, but even without Anne, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Frank, uh, Frank Salzgeber from the European Space Agency. He's the head of innovation and ventures for ESA. His team has initiated over 370 industry tech transfers and supported over 800 startups. He also promotes ESA business applications, uh, which is an ESA program that's supported a further 500 business cases. ESA has uh, over 21 business incubation centers across Europe, and they plan to invest 220 million euros in business cases and startups in the next three years. And hello to Joshua Lexter, joining us from Australia. Hi, uh, Joshua is the founder of Space Industries who have developed a lunar resource extraction vehicle to produce water and helium-3 on the moon. He has over 15 years experience in the mining and resources industry uh, and he also uh, used to serve as a submariner in the Royal Australian Navy. So uh, welcome to you both. Uh, hopefully Anne will join us. Um, I want to, before we kick off, invite the audience to go ahead and submit questions if you like. If we don't get to them during the panel, we'll try and pick them up in the breakout Q&A session that we'll be running just after this session. Um, but let me get started by asking um, both of you to tell us all what you think is the one innovation causing the greatest disruption to the space industry today and why. Uh, let's start with you, Frank. Uh, I think there's not only one innovation, it's the combination. And, um, and I, I, would in this, I would not focus on, on the technology. I think the biggest driver at the moment are the new business models. So that we have commercial entities pushing the boundaries. And uh, this has the impact to all of the space application in navigation, uh, so positioning, GNSS, in Earth observation, uh, in launchers, uh, and of course in, in telecommunication. So it's the change of the business model, which drives the startups, the non-space industry really pushing it. I think this is the biggest innovation. And to explain that uh, maybe, and to make the bridge also to Joshua, uh, why we should not ask Gas de France or Air Liquide to provide uh, gas uh, helium-3 on the moon. So space becomes a normal commodity. And I think this is the big change. So Frank, uh, just explain for the audience, you know, what, what the old business model looks like, looked like and sure. how the new business models are, are disrupting that. Uh, I think we had a great start, uh, start with, uh, with SpaceX and you need sometimes uh, people pushing the boundaries. So I would say our office sometimes, um, uh, we are also we are sometimes the aliens in ESA because you have a standard way and then of course you need innovation inside and the innovation from the outside. In the past you were built buying a rocket, shoot it in the air and that's gone. Now re you're reusing it. Now you have micro satellites, you have smaller time uh, timing in orbit but lower uh, Earth orbit. So this is always the business model. You have more VC backed up. So it's going away from the typical government part which pays everything is I still need it because we de-risk until industry can take over. But all what we see with new space is driven by new business models. Yeah, When you're seeing, and, and maybe Anne could speak about it in Avanti, in the past, the business model of telecommunication were the disk on your house. But your kids, my kids, they watch YouTube. They watch Netflix. It's not coming and broadcasting via satellite anymore. The future of Satcom will be broadband, the internet. Internet of Things, Mega Constellation. So, and I think the business model at the moment is really changing 
the entire space business. And uh, I always say change is the salt in the soup called destiny. So change is always good because it moves things. It, 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 it pays the way for new innovation. Uh, Joshua, I, I definitely want to hear what you think is the is the single most important disruption, but I'd also like to hear your reflections of what Frank just said. I mean, you're you're an example, aren't you, of a disruptive new business model? We're definitely getting there. Um, I think the biggest technology so far has been uh, launch, um, ease of access to space with the reduction in the cost to get to space, um, and mostly with uh, SpaceX and re reusable launch systems that they have. Um, I think one of the, the biggest things is a commercial focus uh, to space, and that stems from uh, space and the moon and Mars is essentially two different uh, new countries that have been, uh, that we've got access to. So a lot of the Earth-based companies are obviously excited about going to space and the opportunity there is so large where if, you know, any any business that you do on Earth, you can essentially um, have an opportunity to be the company that does that on Mars or the company that does that on the moon. And I think that's um, why so many people are really engaged with the space industry. Okay. Um, so certainly, you know, the cost of launch coming down is, is, is a pretty disruptive uh, change. Um, I did sort of, you know, take you on the hop to say you could, had to just pick one uh, are there any others that you would add to the list that you think are particularly disruptive? Um, I'll probably focus on moving forward with space. So I think um, what's going to be disruptive uh, going forward is the uh, production of resources to sustain humans on the on the moon uh, and on Mars also. Uh, and then I think the other disruptive ones will be habitats. So when when we've got the ability to stay on the moon or Mars with habitats and also to produce the resources, to grow crops, to uh, produce propellant in space uh, and just survive there, then it opens up uh, the floodgates to a lot of other different areas uh, moving forward, I think. Okay, Frank, what about you? Anything else you'd add to the list? Yes, and I think there are two episodes which Josh said. One is the lower Earth economy, including Moon. And maybe uh, I do not like the word that Mars and Moon is a new country because a country belongs to somebody. And space and moon belo belongs to nobody, even when some presidents and countries think that. You know, mm -hmm. this is the beauty of space. It's for all mankind, like the open sea. And maybe that should be more treated like the Svalbard Treaty that everybody can participate for peaceful use. So that is the first thing, lower Earth orbit uh, economy. The other part which drives space for the next at least decade, if not longer, is that space is becoming the backbone of the digital infrastructure. At the moment, we are building in space a laser communication network. So it's a backbone laser communication network in space because normal broadcasting will not do it. So the three elements to have telecommunication, that is Internet of Things, Earth observation, which is booming, and still GNSS with navigation and timing. So these three really pillars uh, from, the, from the funding and from the industry perspective are driving space. This is why we need more launchers. We need the, the launch costs going down. And it, this will benefit then also the lower Earth economy and the future stepping out of uh, further outposts. OK. I think if Anne, Anne had been able to join us by now, she would have some views on um, the Moon and Mars being treated like new countries <laughs> or talked about as new, as new countries. Um, there, that's a pretty raging debate. Uh, in yes. the space community and outside. Um, I know we you know, recently saw the directive in April from uh, the uh, US administration um, effectively declaring the moon a, um, you know, a free-for-all uh, zone for commercial exploitation. Um, I won't go into politics. Uh, with but, maybe I, I, but maybe I can add, you know, I'm, I'm 50, so, and I was still with the military service in, in, in Germany. And uh, there were the, the red uh, airplanes and the blue airplanes. You can guess which one. So there was really a, a, a line between what is good and what is bad, or at least uh, the people told. So and I love seeing the space station when you have the cosmonauts, astronauts sitting together in the table on the Russian segment and joining their food and joining <laughs> even their dishes. And and, and uh, the old astronauts, uh, Andre Karpos brought that picture back. And you see a, a very nice shot. You see the Sinai 
the river of Nile, uh, Israel and some other countries and the little bit shady thing which makes the atmosphere. And, uh, and I think that's this amazing picture which our astronauts bring back uh, because this is peaceful and, and we have to keep that somehow. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I've, I've, I like to say that space by definition has no borders, um, you know, and actually is one of the areas that even if there is strife and competition between nations on the ground that actually space, particularly for scientific, uh, you know, objectives is a place where countries cooperate, collaborate and, you know, work well together. Um, however, I think that the increasing introduction of commercial operations into space uh, does challenge that. Uh, so I'm one of those who believes that actually we should be debating that more and that the regulatory frameworks around the world uh, need to move faster to keep up with all of that innovation because these new business models, uh, you know, don't, that we wanna make sure that we can encourage new space businesses to th thrive uh, and survive, but at the same time, you know, protect uh, what is unique about space and perhaps not make some of the mistakes that, that we may have made on our own home planet so far. Um, You're absolutely right. I think I'm going to come back to um, talk a bit about uh, the moon and Mars as um, territories for colonization or, you know, habitation, exploitation, etc. But first, um, I'd like to get your thoughts about uh, going back a bit to the business models. What is the role now, um, your views about the private sector versus public sector funding landscape? Um, how is that transforming technology? How is it transforming the space industry? And I'd like you to think, talk about, uh, you know, now what's the current uh, situation, but also where you think it's going. What's the next ten years going to look like? Um, Joshua, let's hear from you first. Yeah. I think uh, recently we've seen a fair few companies uh, participate in rounding uh, fund rounding rounds and um, be quite successful. Uh, my experience there is we haven't progressed to a, a funding round yet. Um, I think that uh, we've definitely had a lot of interest. So a lot of general VC firms are starting to um, have a look at the space industry. Um, with, this, with space becoming commercialized, um, it's not as long a period till you get a return on investment. Um, so it's, uh, it's definitely something that's more appealing um, what's your view about the role of, um, you know, institutional funding in encouraging innovation? Um, you know, uh, we talked about the European Space Agency um, incubators, for instance. How, where, where do you think the, you know, the, the uh, job is for government and where should they step back and let the private sector step in? A lot of the institutional investors, um, not so much on the government side, but the way that they're, they're focused is on uh, technologies that uh, benefit the space or have a space application, but also have a, a main focus is on the earth application. Um, so there's a few programs like the NASA iTech program, which we participated in. And you know a lot of the um, technologies there are very focused on the earth uh, aspect. Uh, there's a number of other good programs. Uh, ESA BIC as well has a lot of, um, uh, good companies going through them with which have really good earth-based applications um so i think we'll see a lot more of that as well i think you need both you know and uh, uh we supported startups since 16 years so and, and at that time the people were in the space industry were not even laughing that means we we're not recognized now uh supporting over 800 and i think shortly we reach 900 we, we do a pretty good job and it's up to and this is to joshua it's up to the entrepreneur what they want to do. It's not up to us. So, and I had my own startup company, I worked for Apple. So we try to be as commercial as possible to our startups. So if you want to develop a rocket and we have some of them, it's your choice. If you want to do downstream, it's also your choice. We increase the likelihood of the success in an early, early stage. And we just have one company which is doing flying taxis and they just achieved a 1 billion evaluation, which is not bad for a startup. We helped them when there were four, really entrepreneurs and not more. So, and the Irish have a very nice saying, uh, on the shoulders of the giants you see further. Our job as a multi-government organization is to be the giant, 
who allow the startup, the SME, climbing on our shoulders, even down if they want to. So, and this helps to de-risk the business until the business angel community, the venture capital community can really step in. And what we learned, and we have asked uh, all of our startups, until one million is not an issue. You get it easily. If your, your team and your technology is good, easily. Uh, and, and even locally. 10 million, you also get in the, in the community. The problems, what we have are the 50 million, 100, 200 billion tickets. So this is what we're challenging at the moment. So, mm -hmm. but I think the role of the government is to de-risk and sometimes it takes time. Sometimes you need a half year. It's, we are the uncle with the right address book and the right love, being honest to you, but also a little bit pocket money and, uh, and really connecting the people. But making our kids, and everybody who has kids knows that, to have them taking their responsibility for themselves. It's not mm -hmm. our job to tell them what to do. They have to find, we have to, educate them, help them into the time that they can grow. And then let them run. And if we didn't all right, maybe we got a Hanukkah, Christmas or Ramadan card back that, that we have done a good job as parents. <laughs> have you, are there some areas though um, of you know, space technology and space innovation uh, that you feel you know, should or must be funded um, by government, maybe because the risks are so high that you know that it wouldn't attract any private sector investment, and other areas where the government should get out of the way. Um, I'd like to hear your views on that. As I said, I have a very American view on that because I worked a lot for Apple. The government should get out as soon as possible. That's the first rule uh, because and the market should take over uh, and we should really focus where we can add it value and then step out. And of course, if you make Earth observation software, uh, you are pretty uh, cash flow positive pretty soon. Mm -hmm. I just had a call with a big VC company, uh, US and Luxembourg based and about launches. Of course, making a launcher is, even when a micro launch is much harder yeah? and you will take much more time. And, and what Joshua is doing to, to, to think about uh, mining on the moon, you have to think about how you can maybe uh, get, get uh, the uh, property rights, how you can maybe hedge property rights like you hedge uh, copper uh, prices in 10 years. So I think you need different metals. And, and this is where the government uh, has to maybe have a long perspective. You know, software is an easy win because in two years you can really make money. But if you want to mining on the moon, that takes long and it takes more investors who look long term. Yeah, maybe uh, my joke is always, and it's not a joke, you have to think like the Catholic Church. You have to see in three generations. Uh, and uh, they're in business in 2000 years, so it can't be so bad. Huh? Uh, Joshua. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, do you think that there are uh, areas, I mean, um, interestingly, Mariana Masakuto was on the uh, COGEX uh, leadership stage, I think it was on the first day of this conference, um, and talking about her mission-led innovation, you know, her view, I don't know if you've heard of her, she's an economist working out of the UK here, and uh, her view is that basically governments should set big ambitious missions. Her example that she uses is put a man on the moon, you know, by the end of the decade and bring them, bring him home uh, safely. And then they should um, allow all of that, you know, innovation that flows from that uh, to be, you know, to, to go its own way, to be exploited. Her view is, you know, she uses the example also of the iPhone saying, you know, how, how the iPhone only exists because of many, many government-funded R&D programs. Um, interestingly, you know, she also says that gov taxpayers should get a return on that investment, that it shouldn't just be grant funding, you know, where you hand the money out and then let all the startups run away uh, with the big valuations and their, shoulder their shareholders benefit. Um, Anyway, it would be, you know, it would be good to hear your view uh, as, a, as a startup, you know, yeah. what is the role of government funding in your view uh, versus the private sector? Yeah, so as, as a startup with doing what we're doing, sometimes I put us into a different basket to normal startups or to the majority of startups, which just have, say, a single product focus, like a, a CubeSat that takes photos and or looks for bushfires and that's their product whereas what we're doing is we're you know developing a lunar extraction vehicle which is a, a rover that rover can then uh, mine gases it can do multiple different things it can do earthwork construction it can do experiments and then along with that we've also got a lander capability which 
converts into other um, other purposes uh, like fuel storage. Um, so what we're doing is I think a different level of a traditional startup where there's an actual full mission or end-to-end -end mission. Um, and then when we look at, for, for us, we look at the government and we, we want the government to support us because the government support us opens up the doors to the smaller funding opportunities like the VC funds. But also we would prefer the government to do a larger mission like ours because it off of a mission that's going to provide so much benefit stems a lot of other um, uh, technologies that can be used on Earth as well as in space. Like, for example, the to produce our uh, rover vehicle, we are uh, building a pretty, well, pretty sure it's the largest uh, 3D printer for peak material. Um, and, you know, that's the technology that can work in the oil and gas industry. So all the, all the pipe work, uh, the seals and gaskets, which are currently nylon and tef Teflon, can be replaced with uh, peak gaskets. Um, so I think from our side, we would like to see government funding and government supporting a larger mission, even if they didn't fund us directly as the startup, if they funded, say, uh, Lockheed Martin or, you know, Jacobs or one of the bigger space primes, and then the primes, um, you know, engaged us at a request from the space agency or um, even just engage 70% of that, say, uh, budget for that mission uh, went to startups and involved startups would you know that would help startups i think so um good well i think you know there's the, the it's an interesting debate about how you know the taxpayer gets their return on those investments frank but, but i have a, i have a good news uh, and that was in the last ministerial we have one startup in switzerland which we supported at the beginning it's a spin-off from mm -hmm. aspl and it's called clear space and clear space and i think the contract is about 140 million and they become the prime so Airbus is the subcontractor and the startup, yeah. I think they, they had only a round of a half a million. It's about deorbiting uh, and, and, this, uh, and, and cleaning the orbit and, and, and maybe even recycling things. So I think there are good news outside. We need more of that. And that's as I very, that was yeah. made in space. So I think that is very promising. And I think this is also the job of, of, the, of our government. And trust me, it's, it's always hard in, in a government organization to, to push that. Huh? So uh, therefore, every government organization needs a chief devil officer. That would be my favorite title. <laughs> yeah, and, and push the boundaries and say, let now three startup try that. And if it's failing, we try it again. That is about innovation. Um. Well, we'll we'll move on from that topic. We've got Anne back with us. I hope, Anne, that you don't freeze up again. But <laughs> perseverance. Let's um, not be. Let's not be Laura from Frozen. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. Uh, we, we're going to move on to a slightly different uh, topic. Um, I think at the beginning, uh, which which you may have missed, um, and uh, we talked about what the most disruptive innovations are today. And um, Frank made the point that you know. Uh, actually, there's some very mature technologies that, you know, we're all uh, very dependent on today already um, and mentioned several of those. And what I'm uh, curious to explore a bit more is how space technology um, is already impacting the Earth, because I'm not sure everybody in the audience is familiar with that, um, and the benefits that they bring and whether there, you know, are any risks uh, that we should be alive to. Um, so maybe I'll pass to you first, since we've got you back, and to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Well, as we saw this week, with uh, um, the the docking into the the International Space Station, space always speaks to the imagination, and and that is something people know about. But as we see in these times of of COVID, when it's about uh, to when there's about a, there's a, a, a crisis or an economic crisis lurking, and it's very legitimate that people ask the question: But why are we putting all these millions and billions into space? when we have problems here on Earth. Um, I think sometimes space is so successful. Um, as long as something is a technology, it needs to do more work. And as soon as it's so completely embedded in day-to-day -day life, people don't even realize anymore that the technology is there. And I think space has been very successful, so successful that people don't really realize what it means in, in, their, in their daily lives. It, weather forecast uh, depends on it. Um, uh, and, and satellite is really, really, really good. 
at and space is really good in general at bringing coverage so while we're doing already a lot to bring internet to areas like shipping um like areas that are are struck by by a disaster and where all terrestrial communication has has been wiped out and that is very recognized or uh, as, a, as a role for satellite perhaps there's a little bit more to be done to be done there and in addition to continue with the research and development to embed space, space-related applications, GPS, weather forecasting, television, uh, internet to remote areas. Perhaps there's a little bit more to be done because we've been very successful in space to influence the and, and be part of the life of the connected. And I would actually think that where we need to go now is to go to the areas which are still unconnected and do more, more research, more um, investment in making co the, the communications more affordable for the half of the population or third of the population that's still totally unconnected. Mm. That's would be that's that would be what what I think can be done more. Um, that's a very interesting new point that you raise, um, Joshua. I think you know what you're talking about. Your, your technologies are for use on other planets. Um, what do you see as the benefit back on Earth from those technologies? Yeah, so focusing on the mining industry, so the technology and the processing method that we've developed for the moon, for the regolith, um, can be incorporated back to Earth for a lot of the lower uh, grade deposits. So at the moment, you've got the big BHPs, uh, Rio, Glencore, and they're mining some really big high grade resources. But uh, looking forward to the next 20, 30 years, the, the, those resources will be coming to an end. And the only other resources then have, instead of a 60% grade of iron ore, they have a you know 30% grade of iron ore. So they need to look at new new technologies. Uh, and that's where the space technologies can come in for new benefication processes uh, to then you know improve the grades of the resources here on Earth as well. OK. Frank, did you have any further reflections on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, doing tech transfer from space in 15 years. So Joshua, totally right. I'm a big fan. I think it's much better to use stuff which you invented already and then transfer it than reinvent uh, the wheel. Navigation in general, we have a generation which never get lost besides the iPhone runs out of power or the Google, whatever. So that is normal. And our cell phone access points use the timing and our power grid. So navigation usage, GNSS is everywhere. I like what Anne said with Satcom uh, and Nick Resnick Ponton made a nice speech, how we can connect the last billion. Uh, there's a, a amazing, and when you're speaking also to STEM, there's an amazing project, the Pacific Female Satellite Network. So that's about education. You know, we satellite gives education and that gives out of poverty a chance. Uh, I think this this is amazing. And, and we, we have to connect the last billion for a cheaper price, a project like the Brick in Kenya, which also used in satellite connection. Earth observation I love because you cannot cheat from Earth. You know, if there's a deforestation, somebody can tell it's not happening. Space shows it it's happening. If somebody thinks uh, I have to pump oil out of my ship, we catch them. Uh, if you have, if you want really a, a CO two driven or less CO two driven economy, you also have to measure the patient. Space is doing that. So I think. In all of these areas, we have a lot of powerful tool sets we just have to use. And this is the downstream industry. We do not work with the upstream industry making this infrastructure in space. Uh, I think, you know, we've, we've maybe have all been struck by the images from satellites of the Earth during lockdown uh, and how dramatically, uh, you know, air quality <laughs> improved all over the world in the hot spots around the world. Um, and that became something that was very obvious from the space data, you know, that was collected. Um, and hopefully, you know, those those images will help people think about, you know, actually how we monitor impacts going forward. Um, I guess what I'd like to talk about, because you talk a lot about what, you know, what we're already using beneficially on the Earth. Um, but are there, you know, any risks? to that level of dependence uh, on space technologies. Um, I just 
published an article yesterday where I would argue that actually, you know, we are uh, increasingly reliant uh, and perhaps not spending enough time thinking about the risks and how the risk should be mitigated. Um, personally, I call for, you know, not only better technical uh, solutions and operating agreements uh, for all of these new uh, space, you know, technology models that are going up and business models, uh, all the new emerging new space activities that are going on, but also I think regulatory frameworks need to move a whole lot faster around the world. So I'd be interested in the panel's views on that. Sure. Well, we'll start with Anne. Yeah, as a regulatory expert, I, I live and breathe that that kind of, of thing. And you're you're absolutely, absolutely right. Once you get out of the research and development stage and, and something starts to uh, to be implemented to, to a degree, it it's absolutely normal that uh, a stable uh, regulatory framework is 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 developed. Um what I would like to say is Space debris is and, and space situational awareness is is a hot topic. There, there, you know, there, there, there is a risk that we kind of pollute the the pollute space and and that people who tell their children they should look at the stars, their children say yes, but uh, all I see is satellites, um, uh, and and uh, that you know, that 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 has beauty in in itself. What needs to be done there? First of all, the thing to realize is that space is incredibly safe, and it's already in, already re regulated to a large extent, both nationally and uh, and internationally. And the, the systems that are there can still work for the new environment. And where more needs to be done, it often is um, a, 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 a case not necessary of over regulating but of different constituents talking to to each other the the radio astronomers talking to the to the space sector um, and of uh, uh, industry itself working together to map the objects in uh, in space and to work together to manage a, a clean a clean environment uh, and frank and joshua your your thoughts on any risks yeah. and how we mitigate them I think um, if we don't go to space, then we limit progression as well. And at the moment, uh, the Earth's going through a phase with global warming and other other events that we need to keep progressing uh, with our technology. Um, for example, uh, data centers using uh, data centers are growing at eighteen percent per year, uh, using considerable amounts of energy, which is greenhouse gases, uh, which then flows to you know other negative impacts on the Earth. But if we utilize space uh, with the natural temperatures that are lower, um, you know, we can reduce that energy demand uh, and consumption here on Earth um, and reduce the impacts to the environment. And uh, there's another number of other technologies uh, with a similar sort of outcome as well if we keep progressing with, with space. Interesting. Frank, your view on risks. You. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as I said, I was made to pro myself and uh, as a founder. I see opportunities. And uh, Catherine, you said it nice, our astronauts are our best ambassadors. And I think space should inspire. We all agree on that. And I think it's up to us how we build it. And there's a nice treaty, uh, I think two big treaties where nearly everybody uh, signed it. And one of the treaty called the Svalbard Treaty, Spitsbergen. And they signed it in 1920. So that is 100 years ago. And that means in Spitsbergen, everybody can enter without a visa. You're not allowed to pollute the land. And they have very high uh, standards in terms of environment protection. So, and 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 uh, you have a lot of young population there, and I, I think it's amazing. It, it's not part of the Norway uh, uh, country, but they they rule it uh, and they manage it. And I think for space, we need something self, something which is inspiring, peaceful, working together. ESA has twenty two member states, and I think this is why we I think work so together together so well. Sometimes, of course, we have discussions, but they are fruitful oh. discussions because it brings us further. We do that jointly, and I think this we should have also for for space that space becomes the inspiring part for the next generation, this generation, the coming up generation, and the following generation. This is how we do it, uh, and and this I think it's peaceful uh, together and looking back. And like uh, Mr. Hawkins said, uh, don't like to look out to our feet. Let's look into the stars. Look up. Um, thank you. Well, I, I 
I, you know, so many things that I'd like to follow up on with that, but we are running slightly low on time. So I'll t carry those over into our breakout Q&A. Um, and if anybody who's listening has questions that they want to be putting in, we will also pick those up in the Q&A. So be just before we go, um, what I would like to do is go back to this topic of Moon and Mars now that we have Anne with us. Um, and I guess the question is sort of quickly, if you can, um, why, you know, why go to the moon? Why go to Mars? Well, you know, what are the key steps that we need to take uh, to do it? Um, let's start with Joshua. The ultimate for going to the moon is to preserve humanity. If something happens to Earth, the moon is a, a little shell there that we could potentially preserve humanity. But then uh, the other aspect is the moon has resources that Earth doesn't have. Uh, and those resources potentially is the future uh, for energy. Uh, here on Earth, and energy is probably one of our biggest weaknesses here on Earth, which pollutes the environment and you know destroys where we where we live our habitat. So, what are the key steps then to to getting there to achieving that? Yeah, I think the biggest steps just being achieved, which is commercial commercial flight. Um, the next step would be to um, establishing a, a colony, which is uh, part of what the Artemis missions are doing, uh, and that's basically a global mission uh, so you know producing a resource and uh, which is water and uh, water being able to uh, provide all of our utilities so here mm -hmm. our gas power um, water and all the utilities can come purely just from water alone um, on the moon uh, and then with that the habitats uh, to sustain people there as well and then that's the backbones of the economy um, that we have here on earth and will be in space as well um, Anne, do you have views on Moon and Mars, um, human habitation on Moon and Mars? And uh... I'm, I'm afraid I'm very much an Earthling. And what, what, I, what I see is that it's an aspiration. It is just like recreating an environment in, uh, in the, hostile, the hostile environment of outer space. And it brings, to, what, what, what this does, it brings together um, new advanced technologies who are de developing independently of each other, uh, artificial intelligence, quantum, automatization, digitization, uh, space flight. And it brings all of that together into a new model. So things that have been developed independently come together to form something new and that is very very exceptional in history that that there's a time when when the time is ripe for all of these things to converge what i would really hope is that by setting our goal to recreate a, a new safe environment for humankind in space we actually can take the 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 technology development and and the th the societal thinking that comes from that to actually apply it back to earth and also while we expanding our universe have more space it also benefits us on earth uh frank let's hear your view why we do that because a society stops exploring stops progressing and we are especially in Europe, our explorer. So this is, I think, the why. How? Uh, I like really the idea of our director general with the Moon Millage. And this would be like a normal village. That means you have a company who is taking care of the power supply, and maybe you sign a five years contract in advance that they provide power. The same you do with water and gas, because this allows the contract to reinvest and refinance the business. And I think we, we have to put that as not one nation together, we have to put it as a team together. And I would apply similar measurements which you have in a normal city. When you get your internet link, when you get your power, you maybe sign a long-term contract because you get price guarantee. And with this, you can refinance it. This is how big infrastructure, uh, infrastructure projects are done all over the world with the World Bank. And maybe then having a license from the UN like you have on the, the high sea to explore the ground not to sell it, but maybe 100 years of usage. Uh, I think we have to work on it. Uh, I think this is a topic that we could go, we could delve into for quite a long time. So um, I would actually invite people who are listening to join us on the Q&A, and I think we should uh, go into that in a little more depth um, on the Q&A. I guess a quick question. I, Anne, you say you're an earthling. Um, 
Frank, Joshua, would you go? Would you go live on the moon or Mars if you had the chance? Yeah. <laughs> I would Earth first ask my wife. Yeah. Oh, you'd need permission. Okay. That, so those sorts of things need to be negotiated. Um, the Mars in particular is a long way away. Okay, so one last quick fire uh, thought from each of you. We only have about 60 seconds uh, to share these thoughts, but why do you work in the space sector, Frank? It's so exciting and opens me every day, new doors and new dreams and new possibilities. Joshua. Exactly what Frank just said. The main thing is it's super exciting. <laughs> and It's very international and you get to do things um, that impact a lot of lives on Earth all at the same time in a, a very, very exciting technology. Uh, I think for myself, you know, it has to do with how rapidly uh, the sector is changing, that, which is exciting, but also which means that for my children and my children's children, uh, space is going to become, you know, a much more everyday commonplace, uh, you know, line of work. And I just find it very exciting to be in at, in at the front end of that in a way. Um, I think we are out of time. Thanks for an excellent panel, Catherine. If you would like to keep the conversation going, please head over to the COGEX virtual platform and find the Q&A session for this panel. It will not be broadcast on YouTube, so if you have the right kind of ticket to join it from the platform, keep posting your questions on Slido and the panel will answer them. Meanwhile, you are listening to COGEX 2020, where our theme is, how do we get in the next 10 years right? This is the Planet, Cities, and Space stage. Our next show on the main stage will begin at 5 p.m., where we will hear from Microsoft on the move beyond net zero to net negative carbon. I hope to see you all there. Want access to more COGEX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogex.co.